it's first none of them, you know, most of us didn't see it till 2016. And what it means is what it means is that you know um, the media never took um, the duty to take this uh, you know more public you know so more people were exposed uh, to this kind of movie. I think that. Uh, you know, the, as, as you observed, you know, you see, uh, you know, gender uh, uh, roles changed, inverted. Uh, the women with their pistols, you know, just like men, and uh, uh, you know, this character uh, using, uh, you know, embroideries and, and doing his his swing. You know, it's, it's it's something that you've never seen in a in a cowboy movie. <laughs> so you know, in what I don't know what sense can you tell this is a western <laughs> in the classic sense of the word. Well, you know, it's a revolutionary decade, and so this is a you know a genre revision. Film on on Mexican uh, on Mexican terms. One of the things I don't know about, uh, and I, I, I you know I probably asked some Mexican friends about uh, about this or Mexican scholars of Mexican film, uh, uh, is that whether this film now I, I said this film was not shown in the United States, released in the United States until last year. See that was my own uh, uh, that may not be true. Now, in what sense, you know, would that not be true? Because, as some of you may remember, there was a circuit of Spanish language cinemas across the United, across the United States. In, in states like, particularly in states like California, the Southwest, uh, the border states, Texas, there were, uh, in, in the far north as Chicago, as well as here, there were cinemas in Spanish language neighborhoods in which you, you, Mexican and other Spanish language, so predominantly Mexican, uh, were screened there, and they were screened for the Spanish language community without subtitles. So this film may very well have you know, been shown in San Diego, San Antonio, uh, Chicago, uh, even even you know uh, in in uh, El Barrio here, where where, uh, where that, and it was simply you know one of those things where. Nobody noticed it except the people from that particular uh, language uh, language group. But it certainly wasn't released, you know, in the way we're now treating it as international art cinema. Uh, you know, it was it was a program western that got made, and it was and that was that, and that was thrown out there. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. One second. I'll. Yeah. The young lady back there. In the back row. Is, by the way, this is all an argument for why we, we still don't really know film history. I mean, we, we know there's a whole way in which we know a lot of very, very important things. You know, you know Citizen Kane is always going to be important. John Ford is always going to be important. John Renoir is always going to be important. The Kira Post is always going to be important. I mean, the list can go on. We have a, we have a canon. But the degree to which, because of how film was circulated and not, we really don't know as much as we should know about very rich cinemas like like the Mexican uh, cinema, much less much less Indian, much less Japan. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Um, so I really like that you mentioned this this code of honor that happens throughout, right? Um, and that being in contrast to you know legal precedent. Um, I well, firstly, I think that positions revenge killing as an antiquated notion, right? Um, but I, uh, to be yes, it, right, yeah. uh, yes, um, I guess my question is how you view that in contrast to what is, con what is moral and how does that interact with modernity throughout, you know, this film? Well, it, 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 what, I, what I would say about it is what is, is actually what the film says, that is, I think you can see the Garcia Marquez had a position mm. here uh, in uh, in the film, and um, as I said earlier, this this interest in this informs other works of his. So by the time you get to what I'll call like the third or fourth version of this, which is Oedipus the Mayor, uh, this this film is actually set in a uh, territory of Colombia that is a. Um, a Part of the Civil War, in which you have the armed forces and what manifestly is FARC, 
uh, you know, fighting one another there. And he links this, uh, you know, these conflicting codes with not only conflicts that are familial that we see in this film, but that, you know, balloon outward into, you know, more general conflicts. That is, why, why couldn't people come to, to, the, to the peace table? Well, I mean, there's many, many socioeconomic reasons, there's some ideological reasons, politics, to be, to be sure, those are factors. But underlying that, he would say, there are also these features uh, that are, that seem irresolvable. Uh, and that under, uh, underlie this, and that, that, that can not only explain something like this, but can, but can be part of the explanation of something that, that happens to thousands and thousands of people in a kind of armed conflict that, that you know, unfortunately, you know, are not a Latin American, they are a Latin American phenomenon, they infest the world. Uh, because honor killings uh, and codes of honor, uh, as, as opposed to rule of law issues, inform many, many uh, societies uh, around uh, around the world. Uh, yes. Um, I got the. Oh, well, let's, let's do this. Uh, this is so. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I, it's sort of related to what you were just talking about and what the young lady questioned. And um, during the film, uh, he says, La, "Las cosas se repitan. Things repeat." Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so there's a sense for me. Of a certain inevitable, uh, you know, working out of fate, and regardless of our modernity, and regardless of our morality or our laws or whatever we uh, superimpose, they exist. And, and that's that is Garcia Marquez's. You know, he was a, a absolutely. As people know you probably see in the interviews. He's one of the charming men who ever graced me. Uh, the, the, the universe, but underneath that was this fear that fate in that sense lurks there, hence his attraction to the Oedipus story and to Sophoclean and to Sophoclean tragedy. That there was a suspicion that you know we live with the illusion of, of progress and of linear and of linear time. Uh, and that we were certainly entangled in other conflicting forms of time, but underneath that may be, um, you know, this cyclic entrapment um, related to, to fate, both of individuals, but uh, alas, potentially to societies and even civilizations. Um, so I think that's very much the case. As they say, he was. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, let, me get, let me get the. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was intrigued by the early use of special effects. Um, after one brother whips another, the there was what seemed to like be a handheld shot there, mm -hmm. uh, which I didn't expect to see that early on. Uh, also, there were some sound effects, um, both on the ticking of the clock at one point in the women's and, and the uh, sounds in the, in the father's study. Mm -hmm. um, I would be interested, especially in the sound effects. It's a, no, it's a, it's, a really, it's a really good observation because uh, this film, now as people are, we're always rewriting history, you know, we, history always needs to be rewritten, okay? As we know other things from the archive, you know, et, et, et cetera. So one of the things, one of the places that this film now has is as a kind of harbinger of what you call the new Mexican cinema, okay? And by that, I mean, Mexico, as we, know, as we well know, had a great golden age of, of cinema, uh, and which, <laughs> which was, I'm gonna say something uh, digressive, odd, but true, which was created by Argentina. Now, what I mean by that is that Argentina refused to declare themselves with the Allies in World War II. We blockaded all film supplies to Argentina, which was the major American continental producer of Spanish language films, and we deeply invested in Mexico to build up their industry. So we gave them, they had the talent, but we gave them the material resources through investment 
uh, to do that, which produced the great golden age of Mexican, Mexican cinema. And of course, Mexican cinema goes on as a large kind of industry uh, for, for a while, but what happens with someone like R Ripstein is that you begin to see the development of, the, of a new auteur cinema, the equivalent of the so-called New Hollywood. Okay, and everybody, whether they be in Hollywood or whether they be the great Mexicans who are now actually doing much work in Hollywood, but who began their careers in Mexico, uh, like Inarritu, Cuaron, uh, Del Toro, uh, you know, etc. Et they have all seen; they're all highly cinephilic, and so they've seen the great experimental, largely European cinema of the 50s and, uh, and, and, and the 60s. They haunt the cinema text, they know, they know all of this. So the notion, this is a great observation, so the notion you know, of using slow motion, of using non-realistic sound effects is something that they have seen a whole set of people doing, and in a certain sense, they're, they're, they're not imitating, they're applying a new set of tools you know, within, within, their own, within their own national uh, cinema. And so it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting. And thank you for pointing those particular things out because they are, when we're seeing, we're saying, wait a minute, that clock is ticking real loud. <laughs> you know, and, and we're supposed to be paying attention to, to, to it for exactly those reasons. Yes. And then. Yes, uh, pick, adding on a little bit to that scene with the sort of odd use of sound. That's a moment when the older brother is in his father's study, and that's sort of the peak of presenting him as a very destabilized, kind of hysterical character. I wondered if you had some thoughts on that. He's somewhat, he's, he's, it almost goes along with the comments about gender, uh, play, playing with gender in the film, and... Uh, no, he, becomes, he becomes his father. I mean, we watch him literally become his father, and and I think one of the tricks I think it's between us, it's among us, okay, is you know the father in the picture might really be the actor who's the son. <laughs> Shh, we were all fooled, right? <laughs> yeah, they put the they put the stuff. No, no, and, and and we see him, but he becomes he becomes the image of the father that he has taken to be his father, not. Uh, not the image which is offered by the pharmacist, you know, of who the, who the people knew his father to be as this, you know, egotistical, arrogant, um, you know, uh, man who could not take the fact that somebody had beaten him fairly at a horse uh, at, at at a horse race. So yeah, yes, sir. In the '60s, we had uh, spaghetti westerns, uh, cheaply made in Italy out in those deserts of Spain. And we had a lot of the last renaissance in the United States of things. But as far as I saw growing up, it wasn't until El Topo that the Mexican Western became popular. And that was the early 70s. Right. But I remember at that time, suddenly there are a lot of these Mexican Westerns and films being shown here. I think I saw this in Brooklyn in the early 70s. This one? Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, okay. See, and you would have seen it in the Spanish language? Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't speak Spanish, but <laughs> good Western's yeah. a good Western, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> it, it had its renaissance in the early 70s. Yeah. No, no uh, thanks for that, because that, you know, this is the beginning of what I call that, that a tourist tendency, and uh, Hodorowski, um, you know, is, uh, is you know, a, a, center of that, a center of that, of this, this eclectic um, surrealist uh, who, who then, you know, bends the, the Western genre in all kinds of ways. He's still, you know, he's still working, by the way, based in, as many of you know, uh, based, in, uh, based, based in Paris, so. Well, more, more generally, I would say, uh, in, instead of just hanging on surrealism, I would say that the kind of cluster of, of avant-garde movements uh, that we know of from the 20s onward that become part of the kind of toolkit 
of anybody who who allies themselves. So there's there's you know there's there's there's, there's surrealism. There's uh, one of the things I did not mention that critics have mentioned about this film. So this is a, there's that very interesting moment in the film or moments of dead time when he's just sitting in the cell. Okay, and that doesn't forward action in any way, but it is, but it is, it is a character moment because it's when we understand what his 18 years have been like. But the uh, the reason I bring that up is that uh, Garcia Marquez and well as a number of other artists, Garcia Marquez himself studied filmmaking and screenplay writing in Italy. I mean, and the reason he did that is because he so admired the Italian neorealists, and he he literally studied with, you know, Cesar Sabatini, the greatest of the neorealist screenwriters. Uh, and so, uh, famously, it's, uh, um, the film Umberto Di has been written about, and how it includes sections of dead time, of representative time. Of, of in uh, uh, iterative time, that is those kinds of incidents that you see it once on the screen, but it represents something that's happened so many times and informs so much of a character's of a character's life. So, uh, just to come back to your point, so yeah, you know, are there are there you know touches of absurdity and surrealism? Yes, but then is there also this kind of plunge? Uh, yeah. The glasses. Oh, the glasses. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, is he farsighted or nearsighted? It seems to be kind of, you know, the, the, they're really special lenses, as it were. <laughs> you know, he got a coupon from Cohen's Optical and really got to... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah absolutely. But so, you know, so, so it's very eclectic, but in an admirable way. So when he, when he you know, needs to take something from the, the surrealist, absurd, fine. But when he needs to take something from, you know, that, the kind of palette of neorealism, that's there, uh, that, that's there as, as, as well. Um, so I, I, you know, I commend you. It's a very interesting to go back and reread A Chronicle of a Death Foretold. Uh, after you have, uh, after you've seen this film, and they, they really are in uh, a, a kind of dia a, a very very uh, interesting dialogue with one uh, w w with one another. Okay, and yes, yes, ma'am. I'd like to take up a few of the themes that were brought up and mention that the idea of fatalism in the um, oldest brother's character, I, it, it was both conscious and unconscious that he totally um, formed his life around not being his father, but revenging his father. There was nothing else in his life. His father had uh, training courses, etc. So though it was conscious and unconscious, I'd like to bring up the idea that this is part of fatalism, that things will be repeated when, when we have no control of them in ourselves. So we humans, in, in a great sense, make our own, own fate, but unconsciously. I, I, just, I just add to that that uh, one of the things that <laughs> that worked very well in the film, both at the production level of you just go to this little town and it all takes place in this confined space, so that that's economic, that's the kind of producer's point of view. But for, in storytelling, the fact that there is this contracted period of time in this contracted you know, space in many ways underlines your, uh, underlines your point because the, the, these are uh, the the older older son is his life is defined by this place, by this one act that was his father's death, not by whatever else experience he had with his with his father, and he seems to have no capacity to imagine a life 
outside of this place and outside of that, um, you know, of that, uh, of that scenario. And that's also, you know, I'm gonna say that Garcia Marquez is, is always subversive of, of, of uh, very simplified ideas of, certainly of linear time, but of progress. You know, and uh, this is, you know, if, if you, if you're in the post-war world, and um, the big powers are all doing things. Both the United States and the Soviet Union, one of the things they keep, they keep promising, very different models, but we are the way forward. And movement is forward and linear. We're getting to the, you know, we're getting to the moon. We're racing to the moon. And there's a, there's a, there's a whole model of, of time, of history, development, et cetera. And part of Garcia Marquez's um, you know, observation, he says this in many of his interviews, is this, he said, that's not, that's not the experience of the people I lived with. Their, their, their experience of how life and time work is enormously rich, you know, uh, but it's just, it's, it's very, very different from what we're being told and we're be also being told that we can get on that train, and and that train will just move in a single in a single direction. And that's not you know that's not 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 not, not his observation of how life, or particularly the people he's come from, that that he whose voices and whose experiences it was part of his you know project to bring to to bring to the world. Uh, no, understand the world as we experience it. You know. Um, he keeps saying, I, this, he keep, of 100 years of solitude, he said, I, I, these are just the stories I was told. Okay, this is the way that the people I grew up with experienced uh, the world. I got I to gotta go anecdotal on you just for one second. So a number of years ago, I was teaching a course at City College, a place I love to teach. I got another one of my colleagues in the back of the room. She loves to teach there, too. And, and so I was doing a film and literature course. And we, we did read 100 Years of Solitude. So I have this uh, young man who comes to my office during office hours. And uh, I, would, I would call him, he was a very nice young guy, and he, did, he ended up doing OK in the course. But he was what I would call a striving student, OK? He's kind of coming from behind in, in a number of ways, but with, with, but with seriousness and good guy. So he says, you know, Professor Carlson, I, I just finished that book. I said, yeah, and we, I said, we talked about it all day in class, and I liked your comments. He said, yeah, he said, now you, you gave us all this stuff, and so you said that this guy, Garcia Marquez, is Colombian. And I said, yeah, in, in, indeed he is. He's from, he's from you know, Colombia. He's not from up there in the Andes. He's not one of those guys. He's from down there on the coast. He's you know, defined as, as, as Caribbean. He said, well, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. I said, what was it? He said, no, no, no. So if this guy is Colombian, why is he telling all the kinds of stories that my grandparents from Jamaica tell? <laughs> 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 he said, all the stuff he's talking about, this is just like all the stories they tell about their village up in the mountains in Jamaica. You know, I said, well, <laughs> I think it's called Caribbean culture. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, it, but, it, it, but it's also these other experiences of the world not defined by metropolitan centers, okay? And their agendas, whether, whether it be Beijing, Moscow, or Washington, and their agendas of explaining the world and how you will really become somebody as soon as you live and think the way we do, uh, uh, and so you know, I, I, you know, you, it's um, how many you know. I think we have a number of Nobel Prize winners now who will say probably the two people that have had the most influence on other Nobel Prize winners are, no surprise, because this is somebody who influenced Garcia Marquez, that's Faulkner. And then after that, it's then Garcia Marquez. You know, I mean, somebody like Mo Yan, who, who uh, the Chinese uh, one, he says, you know, look, I couldn't have written about the, the isolated people in the kind of village where I was a kid uh, in China unless I had had a model of, of, of Macondo by somebody like uh, Gar Gar Garcia Mar by Garcia Marquez, okay? And yes, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah do, do. 
The contribution of Carlos Fuentes this was just helping the dialogue or just yeah. another quick question because yeah. Fuentes also wrote this book. I don't know if it has anything to do, like El Gringo Viejo, the uh, old yeah. gringo, there was a film. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the, the original story was from Garcia, Garcia Marquez. I don't, um, they, as, as, you, as you know, they were very close friends. Uh, they had, they worked to, and they met as young men, and uh, they had a contract together to to uh, to work. One one of the issues, uh, even at this point in the '60s, uh, it was famously uh, is that though Garcia Marquez Gabo uh, lived actually the majority of his life, he actually lived in, in Mexico. He was Colombian, and so the the Mexican producers were always he would give them stuff, and they'd say. We like all these ideas. Why is this so Colombian? <laughs> you know, uh, and there are differences in vocabulary. There are d differences in this or that. So, uh, uh, you know, aside from their their enormous respect for for one another, and they're both great gr great artists. I suspect Carlos was 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 there to make sure that for the Mexican audience, it was sufficiently Mexican. Um, you know, as a as as a Mexican uh, Western, um, I think th that uh, again, the I, I'm happy you mentioned the late novella or short novel by Carlos Carlos Fuentes, uh, the old Gringo, um, which if you don't know it, I highly recommend it, uh, which is about what happens um, when. <laughs> Uh, gringos, older gringo journalists go and get themselves mixed up in the Mexican Revolution um, and uh, was made into a film which uh, is something that Jane Fonda fell in love with so she actually developed it as a role as a role for her uh, role, role for herself. So, okay. Anything else? Or we, yes, ma'am. Yeah, sure. I got a question. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell me your your take on the his buddy that was bedridden? Oh. 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 Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a, uh, uh, that's a that's a good one because he's his double. He because they were, were they as young men because he talks about how he's learned to be somebody different different in his 18 years even though he he had restraint. Uh, you know, and it, it, he he was provoked for the original the original killing. He does say that you know I was a young man. I had certain I had certain of these things, and and his his bedridden friend is is the person who never gave that up. He he is what you become if you don't give that uh, give that up. And he has to shoot every day to prove his to, to prove his manhood to keep to keep in shape. And then at the end, there you know. Um, you know, the great hope is that, yeah, and now we'll, we'll be back together again, carousing as we were 20 to, 25, 20 to 25 years ago, which is, you know, not our protagonist take uh, on, on this. But he understands where his friend is coming from. I mean, you know, the, 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 the frustration. But again, he's, I mean, the, the friend is so trigger happy. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I'm going to say something very, very, very sad. I, I you know, I, I've, I've had the great privilege of of uh, traveling, you know, I've made about a hundred trips to Latin America, and that's really not an not an exaggeration. And I've worked on several projects in several very dangerous countries, um, and the point is is that this is, you know, um, <laughs> this is Guatemala in the countryside today. Period. There are too many guns there, and there are too many guys who live by a macho code, and that's the only thing they have. Was, this comes back to uh, an earlier comment. That is the single pole of their identity. And so it's the only thing they can, they can negotiate with. So, I mean, this guy who's, who's crippled and yet still clinging to this culture of violence and of, of honor of honor, uh, of honor killings, uh, you know, I wish 
it were backward looking. You know, I wish it was something, this film is over 50 years old, but un unfortunately, while, you know, certain societies have, you know, developed and changed or whatever word you want to transform themselves in ways, we also have the fact that there are particular places that seem to be the sites of, of concentrations, uh, of, of concentrations of this. Um, you know, I, it's a very, very, you know, it's a very sad, sad thing. I mean, obviously this is, um, it, it's not disconnected to the culture of violence of the cartels at all. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's prophetic in those ways. And unless you get out of this, what you have is the culture of the violence of the cartels. And we have it, <laughs> you know, and uh, we have some, you know, we've got some artists who've been dealing with it, uh, both Mexican and North American, and I think, you know, profound and moving ways, but, you know, we're there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Do you know where this film was, was produced, was made? Was it made in Mexico or somewhere oh, else? Sure. Yeah. Sure. I don't, I, you know, I, I, I meant to check on that exactly. It's Michoacan. Oh, Michoacan. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Where? I'm sorry. Where in Michoacan? Michoacan. Okay. Thank you. But but again, this this is, uh, you know. Uh, uh, this is this is what the location they found appropriate to it 50 years ago, okay? And so, you know, there may be a Walmart there right now. <laughs> is there? Yeah. I wanted to speak a little bit about the Western as a film genre. Being a filmmaker, I'm I'm very fascinated by them, and they're not. It's not as American a genre as it gets credit for, you know, because of the flag waving in the post-war periods of, you know, just these great American macho westerns that came out. But really, the high watermark of the genre has always been subversive or, or subversive of that. You know, like this, this movie feels like High Noon. You know, the Gary Cooper movie, High Noon. And it's interesting to me to see how, like, a Colombian who lived in Mexico takes that structure and then makes it his own and mixes it with his upbringing, you know, because it's really the art is in the tangents of the structure, you know? And, and that's what's very interesting because he's obviously seen these American Westerns. I mean, there's so many references that I can just recognize off the top of my first head. Shot. Did you get the first shot? Uh, to me, that looked like The Fugitive, but that might be. Okay. Uh, the first shot of the film of him walking out of the prison is an echo in this, in this pretty conscious to uh, Western people. It's an echo of the very last shot. This is going to back up the point. The very last shot of John Ford's The Searchers. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK? Uh, but it's like you said, OK, here's the last shot in John Ford's The Searchers. And now we're going to start the movie with the last shot from John, from John Ford. By the way, I'm happy to not only agree with you, but to report to you that a fellow named Michael Phillips uh, defended a dissertation which I had the great privilege of directing on the global Western and exactly how uh, filmmakers around the world have made the Western into a truly global uh, global genre and keep reinventing it in, in the way that you're, you're, you're talking about. I think we're at an end here, okay? And I want to thank everybody for being here.